Thank you guys for joining us. Um, my name is Sequoia Call, and I am so proud to present to you a panel of women with such a wealth of knowledge and expertise. And I will leave further introductions to our very care capable moder moderator, Professor Sarah Burns. Um, apart from being the executive director of Washington Square Legal Services, which is the nonprofit organization which our clinical programs operate within. Professor Burns supervises the Reproductive Justice Clinic and has co-founded others, combining law with learning and social science to develop effective solutions for problems that institutions and communities face. Combining her experience in both public and private sectors, she develops courses in litigation, negotiation, mediation, policy advocacy, and systemic change. And I think systemic change is exactly what we need in 2016. So I'm so honored to have Professor Sarah Burns. Thank you. I'm going to stay right here. I've got the easy job because I've got four brilliant people to introduce to you and I'm not gonna take up their precious time and your precious listening with uh, information that you can read in the handout. I'm just gonna introduce our speakers uh, by their names and titles and ask them to go in the order that I introduce them. Uh, we are first going to hear from uh, the esteemed Dr. Heidi Hartman, who's president of the Institute for Women's Policy Research. Read up on her. She's been totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we will then hear from Commissioner Victoria Lipnick of the EEOC. Uh, we will then hear from Emily Martin, Vice President and General Counsel of the National Women, Women's Law Center. And finally, we will hear from Dr. St Stefania Albanese, who's currently a professor of economics at Ohio State University and was formerly an economic research officer with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And with that, I'll turn to Dr. Hartman. Last person was taller. Let me <laughs> give that a try. Is that good? Mm -hmm. In yep. here? Okay. Um, so first of all, I want to thank the NYU Law School Women's Committee and all the other initial groups that contributed to having all of us here uh, today. I appreciate it very much. It's an esteemed law school, and it's a, a great panel to be on, as uh, Professor Burns has said. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in because we have almost no time at all. Um, <laughs> And I, I want to mention that Carol, Caroline, and especially Julie, I think, did a very good job of describing the labor market women face, especially low-income women, and how forms of public policy we might not think of as policies for all women are so important. And these are policies like the minimum wage, uh, paid family leave, which uh, was addressed by uh, Kitty Higgins, or paid sick days, overtime rules, uh, the tip minimum wage and how, that, how horrible that is and how we have to make it better. Three quarters of those workers are women. So um, all of these are especially helpful uh, to women. And in general, they point to uh, trying to fill gaps in the lack of coverage under the regular laws, labor market laws like the Fair Labor Standards Act. So we still need to do that um, to fill those gaps. So uh, I think we've had a good lesson in what the gaps are in the labor market. And um, also in the last panel, we showed how we can fill some of the results of the gaps with tax policy and other forms of public policy. And again, I think that's a very valuable lesson. But I wanna go back in a way and just do an overview of our original laws that we thought we passed to address uh, women's low wages as well as the low wages of minorities. The Equal Pay Act of 1963, which applies only to women. Uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. These are the main laws that we have. Um, and just to remind people, if, in case you weren't alive then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when now, shortly after now was formed, and they discovered that um, women didn't earn as much as men, their first pin, which was green on white, said 57%, meaning that women earned only 57% of men did across the labor market as a whole for full-time wage workers. 
right? So it's comparing secretaries and truck drivers and college professors and uh, chemists and industry, everything. All of them who work full time year round, they were getting only 57%. Most people remember 59%, if they remember that at all, or if they've read about it, 59%. Yeah, that, they put that on there a couple years later, but the first <laughs> one was 57%. <laughs> And where are we now? We're at 78%. So, you know, we, we've made a fair amount of progress, but uh, we certainly haven't licked the wage gap. So um, I'm gonna go back and describe three ways of affecting women in the labor market that come through these civil rights laws and show some uh, remaining gaps that perhaps you have not been aware of. The first one is Equal Pay in the Same Job, the Equal Pay Act of 1963. And unfortunately also, I believe, though I am not a lawyer, um, the way Title VII has generally been represented in, this, in the federal courts, not always, but more recently, uh, that it has to be the same job to, just to uh, get a wage discrimination claim. And um, so that's, that's the first way of the three I uh, want to look at. And um, this is generally at the same job in the same firm, right? It's, I've got this desk and you've got this desk, and whoa, I find out you're waking, waking a lot more than me. I want equal pay. And you can uh, use the law for that. Now, what doesn't that law address, besides the obvious things that women and men are not in equal jobs, the same jobs all the time, it doesn't really address uh, what we economists pay attention to, the wage hierarchy of firms. There are firms that pay less and firms that pay more. And firms that pay more do that on purpose. They think they're getting a better quality of worker and they want to be high in the wage hierarchy for any number of reasons. A good example that might be familiar to you is that among PhDs, women are much more likely to be at community colleges men much more likely to be at four-year research universities as faculty. Um, so this is not really uh, addressed. The law, even if aggressively applied, will not get us all the way, right? Because it's not gonna address those low-paid firms and those high-paid firms. Okay, so that, that might get us down to affirmative action, part of Title VII. Uh, we should be able to get uh, women and uh, people of color into higher paid jobs that they are um, qualified for. And we've done, um, we've done a pretty good job with that in, in some respect, getting women into higher paid men's jobs. Um, an example of this would be women in medicine and women in law. Right, uh, when I was in graduate school um, in economics, I believe that year's law school class had 10 women in it. So we've gotten a lot more equity in getting into law schools, and if you come out with your piece of paper, says you have a law degree, chances are you can get uh, a job in the legal area. Same thing with medicine. Nevertheless, we still don't have pay equality in that, in that area because again, ah, funny thing, there's low wage firms and high wage firms and women are, um, even if we aggressively apply, uh, you know, of affirmative action, it's unlikely to catch uh, all of that, unlikely to get us all the way there where we have to get all the women into these higher wage firms. It's just, you know, you could in theory do it uh, through affirmative action, but it hasn't happened so far, let's put it that way. Uh, and those two fields are especially noticeable simply because, you know, they're among the top fields in our society that people aspire to. Now, some of it is due to, again, I think what several people have talked to, women don't necessarily work full time. They take the time off, they'll reduce their time to part time, they'll reduce um, uh, even taking years off. Now, there's been some research on this which shows that actually Medicine does a lot better than law in uh, accommodating women's part-time and, and years off. It just doesn't punish as much as law, and there's some theoretical reasons for that. Um, but let's look at um, other forms of uh, affirmative action. 
And I would say that uh, it would be about getting low-wage women uh, in women's jobs into higher-wage men's jobs. So forget law and medicine for a while and think about this. Uh, we've been working at the Institute of Women's Policy Research on a grant from the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation to actually look at um, different jobs that women and men are in that would lead to middle-skilled jobs in the labor market, not requiring a BA, but possibly requiring some training above the high school diploma. And we have found, using a complicated simulation model, that um, there are many women who have many of the skills for those jobs, like uh, actually cooks. Cooks have a lot of skills that involve being careful and measuring things and using your own judgment and things like that. And those jobs turn out to have a lot of some 400 characteristics that you can measure jobs for that you would find in jobs you wouldn't expect, like welder. So it turns out that there, and there are other, many others that are closer and you would think they were related. So I'm just picking one that's less related. So it turns out that um, we're trying to make these tools available so that if employers knew, because they're complaining about a, a lot of shortage in middle skilled jobs in the labor market, they can't find enough skilled people. We're saying, oh, look right over here. <laughs> Here's women in these jobs, some of which are very close to the jobs you're looking for, some of which are a little further away, but the analysis shows that in all of them, women would do great in these middle skilled jobs. So that's um, you know, a, a way to spread the, the progress and the value of affirmative action by looking more and more of that. And um, the, um, some of them are also care caregiving jobs from which women could move up. Um, as I said, we did pretty well in the high wage jobs like medicine and law. We haven't made much progress in some male civil service jobs such as police and fire, but we're making some progress. And we've made virtually no progress at all in skilled craft jobs like um, uh, carpentry uh, and so on. And, um, but we do have some hope perhaps for these middle skilled level jobs that we're working on. Now, interestingly, even though we haven't made a lot of progress in some of these jobs, um, the, um, the index of sex segregation by gender, oh my God, is uh, <laughs> <laughs> declining. Uh, but there's, but there's, um, there's still a lot left, and this is a major reason um, for the remaining gaps in pay. So the last I wanted to comment on, and I'm sorry I have to do this, because uh, this is what I told the panel my talk would be about, <laughs> is um, comparable worth, which we haven't heard of much, but used to be a big issue in the 70s and 80s. And this is a way to get all these low paid women's jobs like caregiving paid the same as certain other men's jobs, which are determined to have the same level of skill. So it doesn't have to be the same job, but just the same level of skill, responsibility, and so on. And this used to be a popular thing in the 70s and 80s. 80s, a lot of women were working on it. Um, but it was turned out that it was most effective in the public sector. So we had about 20 states that did something. Um, it works better when pay is transparent, so we have a lot of activity in the states now requiring more pay transparency. And you just saw President Obama require not only uh, require all contractors to the public sector be more transparent in their pay, the federal public sector, but recently all employers uh, I believe over 100 or well, over 10, whoever has to file an EO1 form now has to file wages for each of those big categories. So we are again in this day and age making some uh, progress on comparable worth. So all these three areas that we could you know, improve women's um, pay with are a really big agenda. It's a really long slog to do all these things and get there. But uh, the message is, it is doable. We just have to keep at it. Well, we, we didn't want to miss Dr. Hartman on comparable worth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Commissioner uh, Libnick? Thanks very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
First of all, I want to thank NYU for inviting me to be a part of this panel, and I want you all to know that uh, NYU Law School is very well represented at the EEOC. Our uh, current chair, Jenny Yang, is a Cornell undergrad, but NYU proud NYU law grad. And uh, my senior counsel on my staff, Jim Peretti, is a uh, Harvard undergrad and an NYU uh, law school grad. And uh, I have worked with hundreds of lawyers in my career, and Jim is one of the best lawyers I've ever worked with. So um, with that, um, I was going to spend my time sort of picking up where Heidi left off uh, and explain to you what the EEOC does in terms of its enforcement of the statutes on um, pay discrimination, uh, how that works, and then uh, some areas where uh, the law could probably be strengthened, and I know Emily's going to talk a lot about that. Um, let me just explain that I am one of five, just to give you a primer on the EEOC. Um, the EEOC is the federal agency which enforces the federal civil rights laws, the federal anti-discrimination laws in employment. Uh, the EEOC was created in 19, as part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, came into existence in 1965, one year later. It is a five-member commission. I am one of the commissioners. The commissioners are all appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, we are a bipartisan commission. So uh, our chair, Jenny Yang, I, I am appointed by President Obama, but I am one of the Republican members of the commission. Um, I also served in my career uh, as Assistant Secretary of Labor under President Bush. So a lot of the laws that impact not just what the EEOC does, but uh, on the labor and employment front, and a lot of what you've heard today, I used to be responsible for in another life uh, 10 years ago enforcing those laws. So, and I will tell you, despite what everything you hear about all the dysfunction uh, in Washington, uh, the EEOC is a very collegial group. And uh, we, uh, my colleagues on the commission, uh, Democrats and Republicans work very closely together. So, uh, and do our best to uh, advance uh, the civil rights agenda in this country. Okay, there are two laws that the EEOC is responsible for, as uh, Heidi mentioned, in enforcement related to, at a federal level, related to pay discrimination. The first is the Equal Pay Act of 1963, and the other is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And just to give you a little bit of history on that, uh, when the Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963, uh, which had been a bit of a long legislative slog, uh, at the same time, there had been variations on the Civil Rights Act that were floating around Congress. So a year later, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. When the Civil Rights Act was passed, the Equal Pay Act was, was, had barely gone into effect. It was passed in 1963. It did not go into effect until June of 1964. And the Equal Pay Act was very much, and, and the Equal Pay Act is an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act. The Fair Labor Standards Act is enforced by the Department of Labor, and the Fair Labor Standards Act, passed in 1938, is the federal law which governs the payment of, which governs wages and hours in this country. So overtime, the 40-hour work week, uh, the minimum wage, those are all part of the Fair Labor Standards Act. The Equal Pay Act is an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act. And um, as Heidi mentioned, the Equal Pay Act was designed to, when you hear the phrase, equal pay for equal work, that is the Equal Pay Act. Um, it's not exactly uh, meant to be exactly equal work, um, uh, and that's a, a slight, um, I think, uh, misnomer about the law. Anyway. Uh, when the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964, only a year later, I think the, the Civil Rights or the Equal Pay Act then became a bit of the, you know, redheaded stepchild in terms of enforcement of pay discrimination, because the Civil Rights Act kind of, I, I, it did not swallow it whole by any means, but it, it uh, sort of took over the field in terms of uh, how. Uh, enforcement of compensation discrimination was going to be prosecuted by the federal government and, and litigated in the um, private labor markets and, uh, and by private litigants. So, and 
And, but the Equal Pay Act and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act are very different statutes. So they both still exist. The EOC enforces both. Um, when the Equal Pay Act was first passed in 1963, again, because it was an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act, its enforcement was housed at the Department of Labor. Not until 1978 was it then uh, given over to the EOC to be the enforcer of the Equal Pay Act. And Emily and I have talked about this in the past. I'm not entirely sure that was the best idea. If I were redoing it, I'm, I might send it back to the Department of Labor at this point for various reasons. Um, but again, they are very different statutes. The Equal Pay Act should, should be a little more mechanistic than how Title VII operates. And, by, and, and the primary reason for that is the Equal Pay Act is a strict liability statute. So, so if you are a woman and you think you are not being paid equally to a man in the same job, um, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to get, <laughs> get the notice already no, that I've run out of time. Um, then it, it's a strict liability statute. So, uh, so long as you can demonstrate you are doing substantially similar work under similar working conditions and you are being paid less, and then the employer has a number of affirmative defenses who, that uh, the employer can mount to counter that, if it doesn't meet any one of those affirmative defenses, then you win. It's strict liability. And the, the remedy, you get back wages, there can be um, uh, liquidated damages, uh, but it's, it's meant to be, in the way that the wage and hour laws operate, very sort of, very mechanistic. Title VII is a whole different ballgame under the Civil Rights Act because Title VII is not strict liability. It is an intent-based statute. You, if you allege that you are being discriminated against based, uh, let, in, let's stick with compensation, right, based on your sex, you have to show intent on the part of the employer that they intended to pay you differently. And Title VII operates, there's sort of two theories the way Title VII operates. One is as to disparate, what's known as disparate treatment. I think because I'm a woman, I'm being paid less than a man in this job. I'm being treated differently, disparately. Or there's a whole other theory known as disparate impact, which has to do not based on individual intent-based treatment, but whether or not there is a policy that the company has that may seem on its face perfectly neutral but is somehow discriminating against a class of employees, either based on your race, sex, national origin, religion. Um, in this context, we're only focused on um, uh, sex-based discrimination. But because, so the, so the distinctions between how the Equal Pay Act operate and how Title VII has operated um, are important to how the enforcement overall of compensation discrimination. The other thing that's a, a, a big difference between Title VII and the Equal Pay Act is that um, there are very different damages. Again, the Equal Pay Act, strict liability, you get back pay, uh, you can get liquidated damages, there can be civil money penalties if there are, um, if there are willful violations, but the Title VII uh, you get back pay, you can get compensatory damages, uh, you can get punitive damages, those are limited up to $300,000, but that, that makes it uh, a different statute. So if a woman walks into an EEOC office around the country, we have a district office here in New York City, a very good uh, uh, EEOC office here in New York, and she says, I believe I have been discriminated against because the man sitting next to me is making $10,000 more than me, then she can file a charge with the EEOC that the EEOC will then investigate, and that will be initially investigated both as an Equal Pay Act charge and as a Title VII charge. Whether it ultimately ends up as an Equal Pay Act charge or, or a Title VII charge, either how it's resolved or if it's ultimately litigated, really depends on the investigation and the facts of the case. Um, and just as an example of that, Lily Ledbetter, who I'm sure all of you know who Lily Ledbetter is, um, Lily, Be Lily Ledbetter's case that went up to the Supreme Court 
was a Title VII case. It was not an Equal Pay Act case. And um, it involved an issue about statute of limitations. Long way of saying, beca because of these differences in the statute and because of when the Equal Pay Act was passed and then when the Civil Rights Act was passed, again, the Equal Pay Act became a lesser avenue, I think, for enforcement of pay discrimination. It's not, um, it's not uh, you know, non-existent by any means, uh, and it could be strengthened, but it's, all, it's historically, for all of these reasons and the differences in the statute, been less of a robust enforcement mechanism for pay discrimination. And to give you an example of that, um, the, EO st the, the statistics from the EEOC just last year, so this is just in fiscal year 2015, there were approximately 89,000 charges of discrimination filed with the EOC nationwide. Um, of those charges, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm over my time too. Of those charges, only 1% of those charges were Equal Pay Act claims. So now that's, uh, that is a charge. That's not what's being litigated. There are two sides to how the EOC operates. You walk in, you file a charge, the EOC investigates it. There is a whole nother side of the EOC that is the general counsel's office, and they are the ones who file cases in federal district court. The EOC every year files a minuscule amount of cases in federal district court. Last year we filed 142 cases in federal district court. Uh, so now of those 89,000 charges, the 1% of which were Equal Pay Act charges, not everyone who walks in the door of the EOC has a valid charge of discrimination. Though that's why it's investigated. And I think of the Equal Pay Act, of the 1% of the Equal Pay Act charges filed with us last year, only 7% of the 1% were found to be valid Equal Pay Act charges. So I'm, gonna, I'm out of tie time, and Emily's going to pick up um, in terms of sort of where the Equal Pay Act may need to be um, may need to be strengthened, but that's sort of the historical background on it. <laughs> Emily Martin. Hi. Um, so as Commissioner Lipnick says, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basket of policies that are necessary to close the wage gap to really achieve equal pay. Um, that 79 cents in the dollar number that we've talked about today, that's even worse for women of color, African-American women making 60 cents on the dollar paid to white men, Latinas making 55 cents on the dollar. Really tremendous gaps. Um, and part of what I want to talk about today, really drawing from a lot of what we've heard from other speakers, is how closing that gap really requires a comprehensive set of policies to address um, women's inequality, women's poverty in a broad sense. So part of the wage gap comes from pay discrimination. When a man and a woman doing the same work are being paid differently for no justifiable reason. And when you look, so the 79 cents on the dollar is all full-time year-round working women versus all full-time year-round working men. But when you do a finer match, and you match by occupation, and background, and education, and hours worked, that gap will get smaller, but you will still see a persistent gap which is unexplained. And I think <laughs> that pay discrimination is a big driver of that unexplained gap. And so that's one reason why strengthened remedies for pay discrimination are really critical for addressing the wage gap. And so we heard a little bit about what the Equal Pay Act does, how it's structured, what Title VII does, how it's structured. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting policies being discussed at the state and federal level these days about ways to strengthen the equal pay laws, and they fall into a few different buckets. One is um, improving pay transparency. So pay discrimination is hard to fight because it's often really hard to know when you're a victim of it. Um, if you're working, you probably don't have the best sense of what your colleagues down the hall are making. Um, 
That's especially true because in a lot of workplaces, particularly in the private sector, there are often explicit rules saying you are not to talk about your salary with your coworkers. Um, research by IWPR found that a majority of employees in the private sector, about 60%, work in workplaces where there's either an explicit rule against sharing salary information or there's a strong implicit rule, a strong culture of discouragement of talking about how much you make at work. And when you can't talk about how much you make, it's very difficult to find out that you are making less. And for example, Lily Ledbetter only found out she was making less than all the men in her position, including men who were junior to her, who she had trained, when after she had worked at Goodyear for about 20 years, someone slipped her an anonymous note. And that story of the anonymous note of happening upon this wage gap data within your own workforce, when you find out you're being paid less than your male coworkers, is actually a very common refrain if you look at pay discrimination cases. So um, there's been a lot of activity at the state level and um, efforts at the federal level, including um, an executive order that uh, President Obama implemented for federal contractors to ensure that employers don't retaliate against employees for talking about how much they make, to make clear with strong remedies that having pay secrecy rules in the workplace is illegal, that it's not appropriate, that it's not permissible. Um, of course, not punishing people for talking about how much they make is just the first step. There's still a lot of cultural taboos about talking about how much you make. And I think that there are interesting conversations going on about how to promote pay transparency more affirmatively as well. And one, and one set of uh, factors being talked about is uh, more public reporting of pay data, which could at least give employees aggregate information about um, how people in their job categories are being paid in the market, which is helpful as well for getting a sense of where you stand and whether you're being overpaid or underpaid. Also necessary to strengthen pay discrimination laws is to strengthen remedies. So um, we heard that for the Equal Pay Act you get uh, back pay and you can get liquidated damages, but you don't get compensatory damages, you don't get punitive damages. Um, and the importance of strengthening the remedies available under the Equal Pay Act are both to ensure that women who are discriminated against are actually made whole if they are able to discover the pay discrimination and win their case, but also, really importantly, to ensure that employers have strong incentives to self-audit, that employers are a little nervous that they might get sued. They're a little nervous about the losses that they could bear if they were to lose a pay discrimination case because those incentives help ensure that employers take affirmative steps before anybody brings a lawsuit to really look at the, the, the wages being paid to their employees, to look at whether if there are differences of people being paid differently for the same work, that those are really justified, and to ensure that arbitrary pay gaps are not creeping into how employees are being paid. So it's one really important reason for ensuring that uh, remedies in pay discrimination cases are, are quite strong. Um, another place where there's been, I think, increasing attention at the state level, and particularly, particularly recently, is not uh, focusing exactly on comparable work per se, but trying to expand the kinds of jobs that you can compare in an equal pay case. So ex equal pay for equal work, equal pay for substantially similar work, equal pay for comparable work. I think there's a lot of energy about expanding those comparators a little bit to ensure that relatively formalistic differences between jobs, which arguably shouldn't defeat an Equal Pay Act case under current law, but, but have in some instances, that those differences between jobs that are really pretty much the same in terms of responsibility, in terms of skills, even if they're not identical, um, are paid equally. And there are also efforts to do more technical but important things to close loopholes that um, some courts have opened in the Equal Pay Act that basically allow employers to justify paying a man and a woman different wages as long as they can show it's based on some factor other than sex, even if the factor they're relying on really isn't necessary to do the job, isn't a compelling business reason. So that's a set of important um, 
improvements in equal pay laws, which I think it's, it's critical to, to push for and to talk about. But pay discrimination is only one cause of the wage gap. And that does not mean that we don't need to worry about those portions of the wage gap that aren't caused by pay discrimination. It means that we really need to think about comprehensive approaches to addressing women's inequality. So, for example, one of the things, as has been mentioned today, contributing to the pay gap is the fact that women are very overrepresented in low-wage jobs. So if you look on jo at jobs that, on average, pay less than $10.10 an hour, about $20,000 a year if you're working full-time year-round, women are two-thirds of the workers in those jobs, and as you know, they're just about half of the workers in the workplace as a whole. And women are overrepresented in low-wage jobs compared to the representation in the workforce as a whole, unless they have a bachelor's degree. So in other words, if you look at people who haven't finished high school, if you look at women who have a high school diploma, if you look at women with an associate's degree, all of those categories of women make up larger percentages in the low-wage workforce than they do in the workforce as overall. Well, for men, as long as you've finished high school, as long as you have a high school diploma, no group of men are overrepresented in the low-wage workforce. So for women, you have to have a bachelor's degree. For men, you just have a, to have a high school diploma. And this difference, I think, really starkly illustrates the difference in the experiences of working men and working women in terms of earnings. And not surprisingly, it's not just women who are overrepresented in low-wage jobs, but specifically women of color. About half of the women working in low-wage jobs are women of color. And about one in five women working in low-wage jobs are in poverty, beneath the poverty line. And it's worth flagging, that's a really low line. So again, if you're making $20,000 a year and you have two kids, you're not officially poor. That's above the poverty line, despite your very low wages, despite the fact that you have the expenses of caring for two children. So for all these reasons, part of the basket of policies that are necessary to close the wage gap and to reach equal pay is to raise the minimum wage and to ensure that tipped workers also get that minimum wage, tipped workers who are also disproportionately female. Because when you raise the minimum wage, because women are overrepresented in minimum wage jobs, women's income goes up disproportionately. Um, so that helps close the wage gap. And in fact, if you look at states that have a higher minimum wage, they also tend to have smaller wage gaps, exactly the correlation that you would expect. Now, nearly a third of women working in low-wage jobs are mothers. And indeed, women's motherhood is a driver of women's poverty and a driver of the wage gap. So addressing um, equal pay means addressing the interaction between women's work and women's caregiving responsibilities, which includes a lot of things, like ensuring that you don't lose your job because you're pregnant. If you need some shift in job duties for a few months, um, it means paid family leave, since as we've heard today, the data is clear that if you have paid family leave, you're much more likely to return to work than if you don't. It means having um, job schedules so that you are able to arrange your work life and your childcare, that it's not a situation where you have to call in every morning to your retail job to find out whether or not you work that day, because those sorts of just-in-time scheduling policies make it really impossible for someone who has primary responsibility for caring for a child to juggle all of those obligations. So all of those policies that address work and family conflict um, are equal pay policies in a very real sense because when women are pushed out of the workforce because of their responsibilities for caring for children or other family members, it causes gaps in their employment history which decrease their wages. And finally, the one other thing I want to mention before I give up my time <laughs> since I am also running over is that um, Another thing that is necessary to close the wage gap is to ensure that women have the ability to decide whether or when to have children. Um, some fascinating studies show that a key factor driving the narrowing of the wage gap since 1963, when the Equal Pay Act was passed, is the availability of contraception. And control over reproductive decision making has made a real difference in women being closer to economic parity with men. But if there are barriers to accessing contraception, if there are barriers to accessing abortion, that has a lot of impacts. One of them is a real financial impact on women's wages. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> so.
Dr. Albanese. Okay, well, thanks very much for the invitation to participate in this panel. So I'm going to shift the focus a little bit on the high end um, of the labor market uh, with uh, my intervention, uh, because I think it's neglected in the public debate on uh, gender wage gaps. And I'll explain what I mean by that. I think the media and also public discussion also always focuses on the fact that there are very few women at the top. So we know in academia, there are fewer women being full professors and associate professor with tenure as opposed to assistant professors and lecturers. And similarly, in the STEM fields, there are very few women sort of at the, at the top end uh, of those professions and so on. And uh, clearly, representation is very important, but also um, a neglected fact is that for the women that are there, uh, there are very large gender wage gaps. And it actually, uh, once you condition on characteristics and sectors and experience and so on, the unexplained gender wage gap that Emily was referring to, so the one that cannot be accounted for by things that we can observe is actually bigger uh, in uh, professional occupations and sort of uh, for a high skill type of professions than it is at the low end of the, uh, of the labor market, which uh, is really quite puzzling because once you get at those types of individuals, you know, the investments in education and the commitment uh, to work and so on, and to some degree even family responsibilities, you know, weigh less because uh, the earning power of these individuals is such that they can afford, you know, good childcare and so on. So so you really wonder whether the, f the fact that we see large unexplained gender wage gaps for highly skilled individuals may be in fact due exclusively to uh, discrimination or you know, m more to discrimination than in other uh, points of the labor market. And, um, and also what's really important is that uh, now women on average that are in the labor force um, are more educated than men. So if we look at women and men in the labor force, so women in the labor force have four, uh, three and a half years uh, of schooling uh, more than uh, men uh, in the workforce. And women have in been investing in their education very aggressively in the last 25 uh, to 30 years. So it's really important for this investment to continue because it benefits society as well as women in a variety of ways. Uh, but it's hard to think that it will continue if women are not getting the rewards uh, for these investments, which are both personal and financial. Um, so I wanted to focus our attention a little bit on that and sort of um, uh, sort of refer to some of the work that I did with my longtime co-author Claudia Olivetti, who is a, a professor at Boston College, on uh, the role of um, how uh, you know, we get paid for determining these gender uh, uh, wage differences. In particular, uh, a growing component of our pay, not so much in academia and in the public sector, but specifically in the private sector, in the last 25 to 30 years is what is known as incentive pay. So think about stock options, stock grants, and other form of um, compensation programs that are supposed to be dependent on performance, okay, or observable measures of performance. So uh, incentive pay has grown a lot. Um, for top executives, but also for people uh, who are in professional occupations which require sort of a high degree of, of training, uh, especially, you know, college degrees or advanced degrees. And so we found actually, first looking at the overall population of workers, that most of the, dif of the gender differences in pay were in fact explained by gender differences in, in incentive pay. And uh, because incentive pay is so prevalent for managers and top executives, then we narrowed in actually on that group of individuals or of workers because the data on incentive pay is very, very good. So there we were able to find uh, the following. So if we look at gender wage gaps or, or earnings gap for top executives, so the ratio of female to male pay is about 65%, which is much lower than overall in the population, which is depending on how you measure it, between 75 and 80%. And, um, and uh, this difference is completely accounted for by the difference in incentive pay. So the amount of pay that comes through so stock options, stock grants, bonus programs, and other mm -hmm. forms of you know, performance-based pay. So then uh, we were wondering you know, uh, what the implications of that were. Uh, so we looked at, so one um, uh, justification for incentive pay is that it makes the executive have skin in the game. So the executive you know, is going to act on behalf of stockholders or other stakeholders in the company, and the idea is that these, uh, these entities cannot uh, control the executive directly or monitor what he or she is doing, and so by making their um, pay very dependent on firm performance, it's a way to incentivize them. 
And uh, so not surprisingly, we found that since women top executives you know, have uh, less of a fraction of their compensation depending on incentive pay, they have lower pay performance sensitivity. So their compensation vary less with measures of poor performance than men. But then we dug a little bit further. And so we, we looked at separately events in which firm performance was improving as opposed to events in which firm performance was declining. And we looked at the specific firm. And then we found something very interesting. So uh, for uh, women top executives, though on, on average their pay is less sensitive to variation in firm performance than men, we actually found that uh, for men, their pay went up more when firm performance improved and went down less when firm performance was bad as opposed to uh, ma uh, female top executives. And this is after controlling for title. Are you a CEO, CFO, COO, or other kind of manager? Controlling for age, controlling for tenure within the firm, tenure within the industry, as well as industry um, uh, in which the firm is, lo is, uh, is, uh, is uh, located, uh, as well as size of the firm, which is incredibly puzzling from the standpoint of providing incentives. So based on these facts, which are interesting in and of themselves, you know, as economists, we were wondering, well, what can we do with them? So they clearly have implications for you know, gender difference in pay. But they also reveal something very important about how executive pay is set in general. So one way we can see incentive pay, stock options or grants and bonus programs is exactly a way to incentivize the executives. Another is that there are actually forms of pay that are not very transparent. They are in fact very opaque. Because if you're a publicly quoted company, you have to state in advance you know, the salary that you're paying your CEO and all your top managers. Instead for talk of, uh, stock options or grants and other bonus programs, you only reveal these exposed. So you only know about these forms of pay after they've actually been paid out already. And also, you know, there's, uh, as we know from reading you know, the financial reporting, there's quite a bit of flexibility in the way you set you know, the vesting time for, for example, stock grants or the strike price for uh, stock options that actually makes the pay quite sure despite the fact it's supposed to be dependent on firm performance. So we looked at you know, a variety of uh, gender differences in preferences and indicators of uh, managerial ability and uh, um, you know, commitment uh, to, to, to the firm that could actually possibly justify you know, these gender differences in incentive pay. And we found that the most important difference across these female and male top executives was the fact that male executives tend to be more entrenched uh, within the firm and within the industry because they are older, they have more experience, and they have a wider network of people that they know exactly because they've been in the industry longer. So female uh, women who are top executives are much younger, about five years younger on average than men who are top executives, and they have smaller networks. And you can measure this by looking at you know, the number of firms in which they have worked, are they on boards of other firms given that they are executive in a given firm, and so on. And so in the financial literature that doesn't concern itself with differences across genders, but just with uh, the setting of uh, you know, efficient pay for top executives, entrenchment is seen as, which is measured actually by tenure of the executive as well as age, um, is seen as a variable that uh, is very important for determining the size of incentive pay and has been connected with inefficiencies in the pay setting process. So what does this imply? So the way we interpret this, sort of relating back to the other uh, panel participants, is that um, these gender differences are important for top executives, are important in and of itself, but they also point some to some very big flaws in how you know, pay is set uh, for top executives. And the kind of you know, policy interventions that you know, we would like to see in response to these flaws are, at some level, can be gender specific, but uh, at another level, they don't need to be gender specific. So uh, research in sort of corporate finance and corporate government, uh, governance has suggested that having a very strong um, a stockholder, such as a large pension fund, and so on, on, on uh, um, in, uh, in, uh, in the group of, stock of, of a majority stockholder for a firm, reduces to which incentive pay is used for the top executives, and that would lead to you know, lower gender differences in overall pay for top managers in that firm. And in general, trying to impre increase pay transparency, as Emily was suggesting, would be really beneficial uh, at, at the top end of the labor market, where it's much har harder to measure 
the product uh, that our top executive is, 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 uh, is contributing to the firm. So if you go door, uh, lower, uh, lower down the job ladder and you're producing something that's very concrete and measurable, it's actually much easier to um, you know, uh, measure performance and make the case you know, that there has been discrimination. But at the top end of the labor market, you know, you know, what is produced is a very complex output. Uh, and it's very, very hard to measure. So it's really important at that level that people know what other people are being paid to then make the case. And uh, so, uh, you know, just to conclude, I think some of the challenges that we see at the top end of the labor market are very similar to what we see at the bottom end of the labor market, but there are some additional complexities, both from the standpoint of, uh, of enforcement of anti-discrimination laws uh, that can have, you know, a great be bearing on, on, on these topics that we are discussing. So they need to be considered. So I have a bunch of questions, but <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to uh, just ask the panelists if um, if there's anything that another panelist has said you want to comment on or, or, or maybe pick up on so that we can get a conversation going. I, I do have one thing. It's, it's commonly said that uh, women don't gain as much as men from college education. Now they're, whatever it was, three years ahead and maybe they'll stop going ahead of men in education because they don't get the benefit. The benefit that you need to compare is to the alternative that women would make if they didn't get that education. And that alternative is graduating from high school or getting an associate's degree. And on those scores, women generally have a higher return to their extra education than men do. So that's what's driving women in there. And I would warrant to guess that even in these very high, uh, you know, high places we will never see the like of, um, uh, the same thing is true. They are getting, even at a lower package, no, no stock options, no blah de blah um, their comparison is to somebody, you know, at a significantly lo lower level of management, and they are probably doing significantly better than men uh, in their new spot. Uh, the, 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 the distance between women's old spot and women's new spot is probably considerably bigger than men's old spot and, women's, and men's new spot. I'm not sure at that upper level, but I, I think we could find an economic reason, you know, why they stay at those upper levels. You know, there's got to be some reason. <laughs> well, I actually have a comment on this. So if you, um, so what we look at in economics is this notion of the skill premium, which is exactly the ratio of, um, you know, earnings uh, adjusted for, you know, number of hours for individuals who have college completed as opposed to some college or high school or less than high school. And so, um, and actually the skill premium is very, up until the early 90s, was virtually identical for men and women. But starting in the early 90s, it jumped for men and started growing at a much faster rate, whereas for women, it was relatively constant. Uh, so which is sort of interesting and uh, in and of itself. So what happened since the early 90s, there was this large growth of um, uh, earnings at the very top, including you know, for top executives. But it seems that mainly college men have been <laughs> taking advantage of this instead for women, you know, you know, they, have, uh, they certainly have a substantial uh, skill premium, but it's currently uh, lower than men. And while until the early 90s, it was roughly the same in men. And that's very puzzling. But I agree with you that not having a college degree, uh, you know, may be a lot worse uh, for, for a woman than it, than it is uh, for a man. Uh, but there is this issue, you know, if you just look at the skill premium, there is this, uh, you know, interesting fact that change over time often leads behavior. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to mention something somewhat related to that, um, to both what Heidi said um, and Stefania. So one of the issues that comes up in enforcement in, of um, pay discrimination is prior salary. And when women and men move to a new job, and most uh, people who are HR specialists or compensation specialists for corporations will tell you that they always look at prior salary. And very often, it will be the case that women, they may be applying for the exact same job, right? Let's say they're applying for a job as a computer engineer that requires seven years of work experience 
uh, and a master's degree in uh, information science. Um, but the man is, which, <laughs> right, they're, they're really highly paid. They're better, better than any, get paid better than any of us. Uh, and, uh, but the, the man's coming from IBM. And so he's, he uh, is coming into a job, and let's say the job pays $80,000 a year, and he was making, uh, or, or most jobs will actually pay a range. So um, that's how most compensation uh, systems are structured. So the range could be from 75,000, let's say it's to 95,000. He's coming from IBM, he was making a higher salary, uh, so he gets paid more, because they're looking at his prior salary, he was making $75,000, so they're gonna pay him, okay, new job, 85,000. Woman's coming into the job and she same skill set, same educational background, and she's going to be doing the same job, um, but she's coming from not as an esteemed firm as IBM, say, and she was making $60,000. So they say, well, you know, we have a range for this job of seventy-five dollars to $90,000. We're going to pay her $75,000. And this prior salary issue is something that happens a lot, both in terms of the enforcement of the pay discrimination laws, but it also will perpetuate for years. And I know the professor from Yale, the tax policy professor earlier, was talking about the cumulative effects. This will perpetuate for years uh, the wage gap uh, because, you know, if five years later they're doing the same job, he came in at a higher level, he gets a 5% pay increase, she gets a 5% pay increase, and that very seldom will ever catch up. And I just wanted to respond to that, <laughs> um, which is exactly why one of the places that states in particular are looking at when they're looking at how to strengthen equal pay policies is looking at when is it relevant to look at past salary in setting salary for a new job. So Massachusetts is considering a bill right now that has passed um, the Massachusetts Senate unanimously, it's now before the House, that would say you can't ask for past salary information until you get to the offer stage. That that can't be some screening where you're deciding before you make the offer how, where to slot somebody. That it's trying to put a break on that reliance on past salary in order to estimate someone's current value. I, I, I find this issue compelling because it's my personal equal pay story and I think you guys might relate to it as well because it's a law student equal pay story. I clerked for a federal judge, and then I had a fellowship at my current employer, actually, at the National Women's Law Center, a public interest fellowship for one year, and then I clerked for a second federal judge. And when I clerked for the second federal judge, my co-clerk was um, one year out of law school. He'd worked for a law firm for that year, so I was two years out, and I had clerked before. But he made, because OPM did salary matching, he made about $20,000 a year more than I did, because he'd worked for a law firm for that year, while I'd worked for a job where I got paid $30,000 a year. Um, if you go to NYU, you probably know it's really hard to get public interest fellowships. It's not that hard from some law schools to get a really high paying law firm job. So I don't think that that um, salary differential was an indicator of our marketable skills. But nevertheless, that's how the system worked. And if we had stayed in those positions for years, which of course you don't do as a federal clerk, what Commissioner Lipnick said would have happened, would have happened, that his salary would have increased at a different rate than mine, and we would not have caught up unless I left and came back with some other salary history in the middle. So we hear a lot about the, oh yeah, <laughs> we, we hear a lot about the 1%. And, um, and the growing sort of wealth gap. I wonder if, uh, if panelists would like to comment, have any comment on the relationship between that phenomenon mm -hmm. and the, the gender wage gap. Uh, did you wanna take that comment or not? Sure. Thank you. I just have a question. Since it's not only, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> now I really have a voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm thinking not only about um, Professor Allstott's eloquent comments about the cumulative impact, but also the keynote speaker was talking about the institutionalization of uh, denying the access to a whole host of benefits over almost a century ago for a lot of women's work for 
whether they're racial or sexual reasons, we never sort of pinned an economic value on the tasks that those jobs were doing, many of which wealthy, high-end women do at home for free or with some assistance for someone paid for. So I'm trying to put these pieces together, and it seems to me that may be a factor also to look at in the black hole of the difference in salaries, which is women are working at things that have no economic worth on paper, that can't be assigned a value, and therefore, if you assign those value, you might plug the hole. And if you look at the long-term impact of that missing the economic value of what is being done, the question I have is, at the end of the day, when you talk about pay equity, of course, that's only for people that are being paid, not for tasks that are unpaid. When looking at that, isn't there then a question at the time of pensions that actually there's going to be a huge uh, pension gap between men and women? The Europeans think there will be, and I was fascinated by their conference around that point. But I want to know if anybody in this group of thinkers has been worrying about that, and if so, what we could do legislatively to remedy it, or if there's something in the tax or Equal Pay Act or whatever. Just at the end of the day, the last piece, the pension equity question. Thank you. Well, I'll make a comment related to that, which is a concern of mine, and again, from the agency that enforces the discrimination laws, and that is age discrimination. And I think one of the um, somewhat neglected but soon to be major public policy problems as an outgrowth of the Great Recession is the inability of people over the age of 50 and in particular women who may have lost their jobs or had to take a lesser job during the recession um, to ever make up those wages and who are going to find themselves in far greater economic dis distress. If they have a pension, they're lucky, right? If they didn't spend down their savings, uh, which many people had to do, and I will tell you from, a, again, just sort of an enforcement of the federal discrimination laws, trying to get a job if you are over the age of 50, male or female, but in particular if you are female, uh, is very difficult. Trying to then prove a hiring discrimination case that you were discriminated against based on your age in hiring is next to impossible. And um, the Age Discrimination Act operates differently than Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. It has its own quirks to it. Uh, but I think this is an enormous public policy problem that no one is talking about that will be a fallout from the recession. I actually have a comment on uh, your, um, you know, your concern for sort of rewarding home production, which is not, uh, you know, you don't get paid for. So, and this is sort of uh, based on my heritage. I'm Italian, and uh, as you um, uh, may know, so female participation, or participation of married women, is still much lower in Italy than it is in the United States, and it's one of the, you know, industrialized countries in which it's lower. And for that reason, there, is a, there has been a lot of advocacy in Italy for uh, basically well, women who are married, have children, and work at home, and, uh, and do not get uh, you know, any kind of market earnings. So there were several proposals partially enacted of actually paying um, a, a salary, or a, like a transfer, to women with children who don't work. And then for Social Security especially, so it used to be that married women who hadn't worked at all, they would just get the proposed Social Security benefits for, for their husbands, which uh, was then a problem if they divorced and so on. So uh, about 15 years ago, there was a reform in the, in the, in the pension system in Italy, which in general uh, went to, towards reducing benefits for everyone, but it introduced a benefit for women who had never worked on the market. And this benefit was uh, irrespective of whether they were married or not at the point of retirement because, you know, you could have divorced your previous husband or, and so on. And so that actually lifted many women out of poverty because, you know, they got to the point at 65 where they didn't really have any other sources of income if they're, and, and so on. So there was an active discussion along those lines uh, in Italy and there has been some improvements. But of course, in a situation of, you know, 
uh, declining um, revenues for the government. Um, you know, it's very hard to argue in favor of expanding the social security system. This is generally true in Europe where, you know, uh, the demographics are very against sustainability of social security, but also in the United States. So it's hard to make these cases now, given the demographic structure, but there's actually a very good economic case to be made for exactly these kinds of intervention for the reasons that you pointed out. Dr. Hartman has whispered to me that she has an answer to my question, uh, response to my <laughs> earlier question, so I'm going to let her answer. Yeah, it's not a complete response. I mean, I've been trying to figure out for a while, you know, what is the impact of women's increased work on the income distribution, and I'm sure there are many studies of it that I haven't even read. But, um, you know, one common thing that you hear is, well, likes are marrying likes, so you have two high-income earners marrying each other, and that's obviously making it worse. But throughout most of the uh, 1900s and 2000s, uh, that extra work by women at the bottom of the labor market actually equalized uh, income between families. Uh, but I think to the 1% issue, I think, um, you know, we have seen an, a significant uh, depression of wages, especially in the middle, but also at the low end. There's simply been no uh, real increase in wages um, for many of these jobs, and a shift uh, in the economy of income going to from workers to um, property holders like law firm owners and you know law firm uh, salary is based on a share of profits so the profits uh, are getting an increasing share of the national income and the worker wages are getting a lower share and I think part of that is because women are so easily <laughs> exploitable uh, they have families to support, they have to work. It doesn't matter what the wage is, they're gonna work. They've got to support their families, that's just the way it is. So I think they're a considerable you know, facilitator for profits going, getting higher and going uh, to, the to the owners of capital. And I would add a, a related point, which is if you look at the occupations that are forecasted to have the most growth over the next decade or so, m many of those are low-wage, female-dominated jobs. So the top, spot, the top five fastest-growing occupations, all but one are pay on average less than $10.50 an hour. The one is nursing. Um, Four of them are very female dominated and one is retail, which is about 50-50, but women make up the majority of the lower paid frontline retail workers. And retail is also a huge occupation for women. A lot, a big number of women work in retail. So I think part of what we see in the economy is the growth of these low wage, low quality service jobs that are often women's jobs, which I think goes to the questions of broader economic inequality that you raise. No, I, I actually have sort of a follow up on this. So in general, the, the jobs that are growing are service jobs and they're growing both at the low end and at the high end. So the service sector, which has been growing relative to the goods production sector, is a very diverse sector. So we have these um, low wage jobs such as um, you know, uh, that are caregiving jobs that are mainly, you know, uh, where women are uh, overrepresented, especially women with less education. But at the same time, what we see is a, uh, is a very high growth in very high-end service jobs. So people who are, you know, computer scientists or, you know, engineers or architects or financial professionals and so on. And there, you know, the growth in earnings is very, very extreme. And there's this issue of female underrepresentation and conditional, um, you know, being there as a woman, you know, potentially discrimination. So, so yeah, so the economy is, is structurally changing very interesting ways. And, and we see this polarization and uh, where, you know, you, 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 which, is grow which is what's determining this growing income inequality. And it's really useful to look at both ends because, you know, so it, what's really happening relative to the past is, is this very extreme polarization. And, and when we think about, uh, you know, concerns about diversity and representation of women or discrimination uh, of all kinds, you know, there's different challenges at the different ends. And, uh, and I think it's really important to sort of think about uh, both dimensions. 
wait, wait just a minute. We're, we're going to get a... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I don't remember now. Um, so, right, Bush, right, one of the presidents, they signed into law the Workforce Adjustment Act, and I'm trying to put peace together, like the young lady was saying. I mean, when are we going to start doing policy research on what workers, in fact, men or women, it's a bipartisan issue, contribute to the economy and how that reflected in whether or not, you know, we actually go to work in the morning. I mean, the last time I checked, you know, you go to a Starbucks and stuff, whether you work at a Starbucks or you go to, like, say, IBM and do software computer engineering, you know, either one you have to get retrained for to get new skills for. But it would seem to me to be more important that you work for a place that you can contribute more to the economy and can therefore contribute more to the community, as the young lady was saying, as opposed to just assuming that, again, as they would like us to do, that you have a lot of education, a PhD, you're going to make more. Since when has that become a staple of value of how we live our lives by it, particularly in the country? Whether back in our parents and our grandparents, it's just the quality of work that you do and how that inflects and infuses what goes on in your neighborhoods and your communities and your families was more important. Whereas now it's just about whether or not you have a lot of education, a little education, you make a lot of money. You know, where's the discussion, the tax and fiscal policy discussion around that in regards to, you know? So, to simplify, I think um, the question is probably, is something like, um, is there a relationship between the wages we're paid and the value we contribute to our communities? What, what we make in, in, in terms of income and the value we contribute to our communities? Well, obviously, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's free caregiving and not getting any pay, and and there's all these low-wage jobs that are, you know, contributing a tremendous amount, especially in patient care and uh, home health care aides. I mean, gosh, you know, there's our older people uh, dependent on those people, and those people are getting very little. So, you know, I don't think it's really contributing to value in the sense of moral value. I suppose if you know all of that high income, high end money, were then just redistributed willy nilly, you know, uh, you don't need to work for it. You're just going to get it. That would make more sense to me because those high salaries don't seem to me to be justified. As I think um, your analysis indicated, right? The the firm, the the guys don't get more in the firms that do better and less in the firms that do less. They just get it. <laughs> They're at the high end and they just get it because they've been there a long time and they know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, something like a basic income grant where everybody gets it, some amount every year. I mean, that's kind of like the way Alaska is. You, you get a basic amount of money from the oil. Norway, same thing. You know, Israel, people have told me, you basically have a basic income there no matter what you're doing. Um, so, you know, the world is moving in this way because if all the money is gonna go to the high end, and there's not gonna be jobs and decent pay for everybody else, we're just gonna have to give it to them. Back here on the... Um. Hi, so you were saying that one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of the gender equality, you know, the wage gap is that we often don't know that we're victims of it. S and then I, it's kind of like a circular thing because people are getting men are getting paid more because their previous jobs got paid more too. What do you think is, would be like an innovative solution to that? Because I feel like that's the biggest circular problem we have. And if, if there's any advocacy going on awareness of transparency when it comes to private, like are there any policies on the floor or like any kind of laws that are trying to be made so that you can ask for everybody's salary, in, even in private organizations? I think it's a great question, and I think that it's a place where, frankly, there aren't a lot of policy proposals directly going to the issue yet, that there's some, there's, I, I think policymakers are starting to think about it more creatively. So one of the, um, one of the policies which hasn't been passed in any state yet, but that some states are considering, is a requirement that when you that when you post a job when you're hiring for a job that you give information about salary range for that job that that's part of what you post um, which is useful because it 
creates more public information about what different jobs pay, it's useful because if it's a range, it's also, it's also a prompt to negotiate. And there are also studies that show that, yes, women are less likely to negotiate than men for various reasons, one being that people don't like when women negotiate and it doesn't get a positive response in the same way. But that when you give a prompt to women saying this is a negotiable moment, <laughs> that suddenly the rates of negotiation are the same. And so I think that there are some interesting questions being asked about how to increase transparency. But I think we're at the be beginning of that conversation. I think that there's also a need for um, corporate leaders that care about these issues to be change makers and to be uh, public examples of transparent companies. And there are some, there are some tech companies in particular that are experimenting with pay transparency, not even necessarily as a gender issue, but just as a worker empowerment issue more broadly. So there are some tech companies that have been very public about the fact that all of their salaries are public within the organization. But there are also different degrees of transparency you could imagine. You can imagine rather than literally handing out everybody's salary to every employee in the organization, being public about ranges within each position, um, having some sort of public reporting that um, didn't identify individuals by salary but gave information about pay groupings and what the gender breakdown was in particular pay groupings. So I think that's a place, frankly, where we'll see a lot of energy in coming years because there is growing recognition that um, pay secrecy is really an enemy of all sorts of equality efforts, gender equality efforts and others. So do you have another minute? Yeah. I think another thing that's important is norms change, is people getting comfortable with the idea of talking about how much they make. Um, I think that part of what is necessary is more cultural comfort with women, but people, talking about their salaries, because um, that discomfort is part of what allows the secrecy to flourish. I just want to respond that there is one of the high-tech firms that have said we will not negotiate with anyone which means your past salary is irrelevant. So if the job is posted at 100,000, that's it, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of very creative things that I think they are doing out there. Do we have time for one more question? We've had a burning question back here, I think. Oh, sorry. That's all. Hi, thank you. I actually just wanted to build on the conversation about uh, the link between income inequality, especially at the high end, and this conversation, because it seems like uh, you know there are, a there are a lot of stories about what's been driving inequality growth over the last 40 years, and one thing that we've realized um, in the data over the last decade is how much of inequality growth, especially over the last maybe 20 years, has been driven at by inequality growth at the very high end, like the 1% pulling away from the 2% and the 4%. And interestingly, there's a labor capital story there, but there's also a huge um, executive compensation and high-end labor market story there. And I'm wondering, it seems like your research really fits well into the literature around rent seeking at the high end and the idea that this isn't skill bias technological change, this isn't all trade and all these other things. It's, it's a lot of being able to manipulate the system at the top end. And if so, if you see it that way, um, I'm wondering what it has to say about how we think about taxes and compensation policy at the high end and whether policies designed to neutrally limit that kind of rent seeking could also help narrow the gender wage gap. You are completely right. So the evidence really suggests that the growth in the skill premium in the last 15 years has been driven by incomes at the very, very top, top 1% of 2%. And it's, there has been a change in that the people who used to be in the top 1% were mainly recipients of what is known as capital income. So they owned firms or they owned uh, you know, uh, financial assets and they would get income from that. But now at the top, the people who are in the top 1% are typically executives of large corporations. And so what they get is in quote, labor income because it's earnings from labor, but in fact it's mostly in the form of capital income because it comes from 
returns from stocks in the company that they own. And you know, going back to my previous intervention, it seems that th there's a lot of inefficiencies in the way that those, uh, those kinds of uh, you know, pay policies are set. So what to do about it? Now, that, that's, a, that's a, um, uh, you know, a difficult question. From a pure direct tax policy, so who are the people really in the top 1%? Most often are people who are executives in finance. And I as you know, in finance, there's this issue of the carry trade and carry trade income which is taxed at very, very low rates. So there's, there's an incentive to transform you know, income in carry trade income because it will be taxed a lot less. So that's a huge loophole, and that will definitely help. It doesn't then you know, help along the lines of executives in other sectors where they're not getting that kind of income and are still getting paid uh, you know, very highly. But so certainly you know, um, you know, uh, making sure that all incomes you know, get taxed at the same rate, which is, you know, in the U.S. we have a progressive, you know, tax rate system. And there isn't a way to, you know, mask income into some other forms of income that get, get taxed advantageously. That would actually do a huge amount, uh, you know, because I I if you look at the history of the United States and of advanced economies in the 20th and 21st century, so inequality always went down a lot when the income tax base became broader. And, and, uh, and tax rates became you know, slightly more progressive. But you don't need to in increase tax rates at all. What you need to make sure is that you're you know, taxing all sorts of income. And there isn't one type of income that's being taxed a lot less because this gives really adverse incentives. So going back to, to your intervention in tax policy, just making all incomes you know, subject to the same schedule as opposed to some income subject to a different schedule that also happens to be much lower would really help. Uh, in, in this dimension. And then, of course, there's our corporate policies that were discussed before that would also help. So we're out of time, and let's give a thanks to our panel once more. <laughs>